gemacht, wenn zu der ähm, Welt, die ist der Welt und Herr Gastgeber des Abends, Kyle Jarrow. Um, Kyle is a, um, a semanticist, he works on Latin <coughs> semantics, he also works on syntax and pragmatics. Um, his his um, research expertise is in various interfaces in Bantu languages. Um, he has worked extensively on Kenya Rwanda and has conducted field work in Rwanda several times. Um, Kenya Rwanda is a, is a, a bigger Bantu language and there is in fact quite some work already which has been done. There's no um, Kamyanki mm -hmm. in the States, there's no Belgian work. Um, but then Kyle went back and revisited some of the classic topics in, in the in the more syntax and semantics in Yolanda, and actually found that there's much more variation in that much much more you know undetected detail, and through that has you know brought the like Bantu scholarship to a higher level than the classic situation where you have one or two people working the language and you think that's it, and, and it really shows very well that revisiting these things where we think we know quite a lot about actually turn out to be much more complex than we are. Um, his PhD is from the um, University of Austin in Texas. He, he then had a small postdoc and then he almost came to SOAS. So <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> where, where we got funding for Kaya to join us here, but then he got headhunted, which is not not often <laughs> based. It is not the sort of field where that happens, but it is <laughs> really happened. So he then got headhunted by the University of Essex, where he is now a lecturer in linguistics. And through that, and also the movement of Hannah, who also comes from here to Essex, Essex is now developing into the center of Bantu linguistics in the UK. It's like unexpected, yeah. but, but still, sorry. Um, so that's very exciting, but it's exciting, of course, for us in the UK as a community. Um, so we are very pleased that that Hal is in the UK at Essex, and we're very pleased that he is here this afternoon. He's going to talk about verb meaning and variance exchange morphology insights from Bantu. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Um, so in this talk, I want to look at the role of verb meaning and how this um, comes into play with valency changing morphology. So morphology that increases or decreases the number of arguments that are in a particular clause. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on applicative morphology, which is a kind of suffix which adds a new object to the clause. These are talked about a lot in Bantu languages and actually in a lot of that classic work that Lutz um, mentioned earlier. And what I'm going to investigate here is how the meaning of the verb that the applicative attaches to um, determines the kinds of readings that you can get um, with the applicative. Um, in the end, I'm going to talk a little bit, a very little bit, I think, uh, about the morpheme ik, which is a detransitivizing um, suffix in Kinyarwanda. I'm going to look again at how the meaning of a verb can come into play with understanding the, the use of these forms. So just a, a little bit of background on argument structure and valence. Um, verbs vary in the number of arguments that they have, um, and this can in, uh, often matches directly to the semantic description of these verbs. So if we see in 1A, we have the event of running, which involves one person, the person doing the running. And in this case, we have one argument, the subject, John ran. Um, in two, or excuse me, 1B, we have a transitive verb, two different arguments, John picked mangoes. Uh, this event involves two participants, John and the mangoes, and this sentence licenses both of those in the syntax as arguments. Um, one C is just another example with, with three arguments. Um, one thing to keep in mind as we go through this talk, and that becomes a bit uh, of a, a, a kind of nebulous thing, is when verbs um, describe an event that has multiple participants but doesn't tell you what those are. So for example, from English uh, into A, we have John ate mangoes. So we're saying all of the participants that are there, John and the thing that he's eating. Um, but in 2B, we can also just say John ate. And there we're leaving you hanging on what that participant is. It's not there syntactically, but semantically, we know that it has to be there. He has to be eating something for that sentence to be true. Um, many languages around the world have um, morphemes dedicated to changing the number of arguments that a particular verb has. Um, so one example, well-known example, are causative uh, morphemes where you have an increase in the number of arguments and you add a new subject to the clause. So in 3A, we have an example from Japanese where we have an intransitive verb, the vegetable rotted, and then in 3B, we have a causative morpheme adding a new subject to the clause, making it two different, two arguments instead of just one, as in two, or excuse me, 3A. Um, the suffix I'm going to focus most on today is called the applicative morpheme. Um, again, this is found throughout many of the world's languages. Um, in Bantu, it's a suffix that's added on to the verb. And generally, in, in many classic works, it's described as adding a new object into the, the structure of the sentence. So we have in 4A, this is an example from Kinyarwanda. Um, the man 
wrote the story. This here is the verbal complex for no idea what that is. <laughs> uh, for <laughs> it wasn't me. It was something else I stepped on. Just to be clear, <laughs> we have <laughs> for <laughs> with two arguments, and then here we have this uh, applicative suffix ir. Sometimes it'll come up as er, depending on some phonological factors that I won't worry about here. Um, but crucially, what this is doing is it's adding in a new um, participant and argument into this event. So we have in 4a, uh, the man is writing the story. But in 4b, the man is writing the story for the child. And the child is this new applied object. And in this case, it's the beneficiary of the event. Um, so, so often, um, the applicative. Uh, adds this new object and then adds some thematic information about that object. It's kind of the classic story of what applicatives do. Um, one thing that I can make clear is that it seems to never be an agent or a theme. There may be reasons for that. I'm not going to engage with that here. Um, but the roles that often show up with um, applicatives are beneficiaries, um, instruments, and locations. There's a variety of others that you'll find, but these are the three that always seem to be there if a language uses this strategy. Um, there are many, 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 many uh, syntactic analyses of applicatives in the literature, but almost all of them assume that the applicative has a very specific function. It adds this new object and adds some thematic role. Um, and my kind of task today is to problematize that story um, and give examples of ways in which that's not the case and then give an analysis of how we can more uh, hopefully capture what applicatives are doing. Um, here are some examples from other Bantu languages. So we have um, in Runyambo an example in five of a locative applicative. So we have the applicative ir and then the locative phrase there. In this case, adding a new object and a, assigning it a location role. In six, we have an example from Ndebele with a benefactive applicative. So an event that's happening on behalf of the mother. And then in seven, we have an example with an instrumental applicative. Um, where the event is happening uh, by the use of a stone. And again, in each of these cases, we have the applicative morpheme adding these new objects. So um, despite this general trend, as I kind of foreshadowed a second ago, it's been kind of pointed to in different works, um, different grammars, different descriptions of languages, that you don't actually always get an increase in the number of arguments. Um, so here's an example from mostly locative applicatives that some people have noted. Um, and I'll come to examples of this in Kinyarwanda in a bit. Um, but a lesser discussor point um, is that the contribution of the applicative is constrained by the meaning of the verb. Um, so often these things are thought of as you take the meaning of a verb, you take this applicative form, you put them together, this is what you get. Um, what I'm going to show here, based on uh, work from Kinyarwanda, but you see this in other languages as well, is that the verb really says, OK, I have an applicative now. I have a set of options of things I can do. And what are those options is kind of the question that I want to tackle. And again, I'm going to look almost exclu exclusively at Kinyarwanda here. Um, but in particular, I'm going to look at two case studies. So um, first is going to be different classes of motion predicates, so verbs that describe ways of motion. And I'm going to show that each of these different verbal subclasses of motion uh, require a different thematic role for their applied object. And this is evidence for us that the verb is what's in charge of defining what the thematic role is. And then I'm going to talk about a class of ditransitive verbs where we don't actually see any increase in the number of arguments, but a change in the interpretation of one of the existing arguments of the non-applied verb. Um, and from these two case studies together, we can propose that the contribution of an applicative um, is either a syntactic position, thematic material, or both. And then this typology can give us the entire range of meanings that you get in Kinyarwanda and ideally in other languages. I'm just going to keep running into this, I think. OK, so um, there's a lot of detail that I'm about to give you. And we're going to go through a bunch of different examples. But the high level point here um, that we don't want to lose track of is that the, the, this case study is telling us that certain verbs require a certain thematic role for their applied object. Um, so we're going to look at manner verbs, path verbs, and verbs of departure. I'm going to show that each of these has a specific thematic role. I'm going to go these, through these a bit quickly. Um, so manner of motion verbs are verbs that describe 
motion and how the figure moves uh, when doing that. So these are things like, uh, in Kinyawanda, Kwiruka run, Gutembera to go about or to wander, uh, Gusimbuka to jump. Um, and in these cases, whenever you have the applicative morpheme, you get a locative applied object, but it's specifically the goal of the motion event. So if we think of motion as a thing that happens, items start in a place, the source, they traverse some route, and then they end up at a goal, right? So in this case, our verb is telling us that our applied object must be the goal of the motion event. And crucially, it is not the case that it can be the source or the route. So this class of verbs, when you have a locative applied object, can only have a goal interpretation. This contrasts with, say, path verbs. So these are verbs, um, the English equivalents of, uh, excuse me, kinderwander equivalents of enter, exit, descend. Um, all of these have a route applied object. So crucially, the thematic role of this class of verbs is different from the manner of motion verbs. And this class of verbs can only have a route interpretation for the applied object. Um, the cool thing is, uh, well, I, I was really excited when I found it, is that you see each of the logically possible types of motion thematic roles. So you find a goal, which we've seen, a route, which we've seen, and then there's also a class of verbs for which you find a source uh, applied object. So we have um, verbs like cross, uh, to alight, to fly, and all of these have this interpretation where you get the source of motion as the applied object thematic role. Um, and again, crucially, only that interpretation. So each of these verbs is saying, this is my thematic role and my thematic role alone, right? Um, which is, again, very nice in that there's all of the logically possible things are tested and we can see them. Um, here's a summary again. So we get a goal reading with manner of motion verbs like run. We get a route applied object meaning with path verbs such as enter. And then we get a source with departure verbs such as cross. All of that is to say that this is telling us that verb class matters as far as the interpretation of the applied object. Because what verb you're using is conditioning what is possible as the thematic role of that applied object. Um, so then turning away from motion verbs, we're going to set them aside. We'll come back to them in a bit. Um, I want to talk a little bit about ditransitive verbs. So these are verbs. Um, I'm using this term to mean verbs that describe three participants semantically. So things like giving, like I gave someone a book. There's me, the person who receives the book, and then the book. Um, in this class in Kinyarwanda, you often find that it can map to verbs with three arguments or two arguments. Um, and you find a variety of different subclasses, um, most of which are not relevant to us. So there's a class where um, the applicative adds a new beneficiary. Actually, I'll just go through the data as I talk about it. Um, we find a class where the applicative adds a new beneficiary, actually giving you a sentence with four arguments. Um, these aren't going to be relevant to us, because actually this is the classic case of applicativization. You just add a new beneficiary argument. There's a class where uh, there's only two arguments in the base form of the verb, and then the applicative gives you a recipient. Um, this, is, this is actually an interesting class in that recipient is um, only allowed as a thematic role in this particular class. So again, this supports this notion that verb class matters as far as what the possible thematic roles are for the applied object. We're not going to pursue this class much here. What I am interested in is this class, this, this uh, Gutera class, where you have a lexically ditransitive verb with three arguments, and the applicative comes along and doesn't change the argument structure of the verb. So in 16a, we have three arguments. We have karimera, we have the rock, and we have mhusi. And in 16b, we have that exact same number of arguments. Karimera, the rock, or in this case, a ball, and mhusi. The crucial difference between these two is the interpretation of that, uh, of mhusi. Uh, so in 16a, the verb describes an event where someone is chucking the rock at mhusi, and he is probably not even aware that there's a rock coming at him. It may be done with some kind of malicious intent or a, a desire to harm Nhusi. Um, whereas in 16b, Nhusi is the intended recipient of the event. So this is like I'm playing catch with Nhusi and I want to give him possession of the rock. Um, and these are really robust judgments with speakers. They really categorically put them in these two kind of categories um, for each of these classes of verb. And so it seems here that the, uh, the difference between the two isn't related to argument structure, but is actually the semantics. So um, one little kind of side trip we have to take is that 
it is logically possible that there is a transitive verb, gutera, with two arguments, and then that this kind of potentially problematic case is just built from that. So you're taking two arguments and then getting three arguments, and actually there's nothing interesting. There is a change of valence, um, and so my whole point doesn't stand. The next couple of slides, I'm going to show that actually the three argument non-applied variant of this verb and the applied variant of this verb are related to one another. That's, that's kind of a very, there's a lot of, is there like a marker I can be? Uh, I think we'll be okay. So the, the, the reason none of this is actually a problem is that the transitive use of this verb means something slightly different from the ditransitive use of this verb. So in 17, we have the transitive use of the verb, and it actually means something more like to play ball. Um, it's ambiguous as to whether it's play ball with your feet or with your hands. Um, so it can mean something like kicked around uh, a football or, or played something like American football. Um, but crucially, not throw. That you're not displacing the ball and, and with the intention of putting it somewhere else. Um, to get that reading, you have to add some kind of dummy object. So you have to add, in this case, uh, ishoti, a shot. So uh, Husi took a shot of some kind, either throwing or kicking it. Um, and just to really drive the point home, if you give a context, so um, say I walk up to a crime scene and I see a knife, and I pick up the knife, but then realize holding this knife in this crime scene makes me look like I've committed the murder and I want to get rid of that knife as soon as possible, you cannot use the transitive use of this verb in that context. What this is telling us is in a context where you have to have directed motion, you can't use the transitive version of gutera. You'd have to use, if you wanted to use gutera, you'd have to use the ditransitive variant of this verb, which is then evidence for me that that is the variant that relates to the applicative, and so there's no change in valence. There's three arguments and three arguments. So all of this is to say, if we kind of rope both of these case studies together, um, that the verb determines the interpretation of the applied object in various cases, and that there are cases where there's no increase in valency. I showed you here with a subclass of ditransitive verbs, but this has been seen in um, handfuls of other cases in other Bantu languages as well. So what I propose is that there are two components to the contribution of an applicative, and crucially, these two things can act independent of one another. So you can have a syntactic increase in the number of arguments, namely adding an object, or, you can have the uh, new semantic information about an argument or both. And the both case would be the classic applicatives, and then these other combinations will be these other cases I've talked about here. Um, I'm going to throw some lambda calculus at everybody, but I'm going to try and keep it, um, keep it like lambda, lambda light. Um, so to represent the semantic contribution of an applicative, um, we want Two, two things, essentially. We want to say, these are just functions, right? So we want a function which talks about some argument that is not part of the verb originally, or we want a function that can talk about an argument of the verb, right? And that's the, the two different semantic contributions of applicatives. We have um, the difference, yeah, we have between is this argument part of the original verb meaning or is this argument part of the original verb meaning? Um, and then we combine that with, is this applicative increasing the valence or not? So in 21, we just have a simple lexical rule between the predicate argument structures where we have some number of arguments, and then when we have the applicative, we have an extra one. Um, or we can have a case where the applicative does not add a new syntactic argument position. So given these different possibilities, we end up with three possible uh, combinations of things. We have a case where you add a new argument position, a new object, and assign some thematic role to it. Great, that's what the classic view of applicatives always was. We have cases where you have a new applied object. So you have a new syntactic position, but actually the thematic role of that is coming from the verb and not from the applicative. And then in 25, we have a case where there's no additional syntactic position, but something's being said about an argument of the verb. And that is each of those kind of respectively. Ideally, um, this is broader than just Kenya Rwanda. This is a kind of possible types of what you should expect with applicatives. The details in a particular language may vary of what works where. I have some ideas about why you would find the kinds of variation you might find. Um, but the next stage of this would be to expand this study into 
other Bantu languages, other applicative languages. Would this be a bad time to ask for further clarification no, go ahead. the difference between them? Yes, I could actually, it might help. Um, somehow, no matter where I put that, it's in my way. Um, so in 23, we have the classic applicative case. Uh, 24 would be. Um, so in the, the first, that would be like adding a bad, a bad factor. Exactly. And I'll, I'll have some examples here in a second. Um, in 24, this is going to be the motion events, where the verb's the one defining what the thematic role is. And then in 25, it's going to be these ditransitive verbs where there's no change in valence at all. Again, that's all for Kinyawanda specifically. I, ideally, this is a, a broader typology that you should have. But um, I'll, yeah, I'll show you here actually now. So we can walk through kind of a bit more slowly this first example. So in this case, we have. Um, with the verb kuvuga, which is to talk, we have a new argument and a new thematic role. This is our classic case of applicativization. So here we have the, the verb kuvuga, and then this is the semantic definition of what that verb means. It's saying that there is one argument, and it's linked to some event. That argument is an agent, and the event is a talking event, which is all just a fancy way of saying that that's what the verb talking means, right? There is someone, and they talk, right? Um, and in this case, the syntax here has just one one argument. Then in 28a, we have the applicative that you would have in that case. So this formula here, I won't go through it all in much, because the crucial point here is that this formula is just talking about an argument that is not originally part of the verb. It's adding in a new argument outside of what was there originally. And then the syntax is increasing the number of arguments. So when we take 27a, and we combine that with 28a, we get, if we go through the derivation in 29, which is boring, we get 29c, which is the combination of the applicative and the verb meaning, um, which is that there's a talking event, there's some agent of that event, namely the person talking, and then there's a description of the location of that event. Um, and then 29d, we have two arguments, again, like we want, and this would correspond to an applicative version of this verb in 30a. Uwase is talking in the house. Could yeah. you briefly explain what the implicative is? This. Yeah, the, the, what does is, what is implicative do? Implicative. It, it, uh, no, implicative, oh, yeah. Sorry. Ah, sorry, yeah, 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 sorry. That, yeah, it's imperfect. My yeah. hearing is terrible, sorry. Um, yes. Um, any other questions there? Actually, this might be a good time to make sure everyone's somewhat on the same page with me. And to drink my water. Um, so that would be the classic case of applicatives, what, what most people have noticed in the literature. Um, in this case, we have these motion predicates, where the class of motion that you are is going to determine the thematic role of your specific applied object. And so what we have here is a slightly more complex um, story. These verbs have more participants going on, since, like I said earlier, motion always involves a source, a route, and a goal. Um, so there's some details here that I will gloss over very, very quickly. But for this verb, cross, its applied object is going to be a source, which we'll see in a second. It'll combine with this denotation of the applicative, um, which the location is going to be an argument of the verb. So it's not talking about something new. And there is a syntactic increase. So essentially what this, this is all doing is it's adding a new slot, a new syntactic slot, that the verb wanted to have but couldn't have otherwise is kind of a way of thinking of it. Um, so essentially the verb has all these participants. It has the full description of these motion events, but it only has two arguments to work with, so it can't tell you about all of these. So what the applicative is doing is giving it an extra position. The verb says, ah, oh, thank god, I can now talk about this source. Which is what we get here when we combine all the little pieces. And so we end up with a sentence in 35a, cutting that across the ocean from Mombasa. And if you were to take this denotation of applicatives and combine it with any of those other motion subclasses, you would get the desired result, but for the relevant, uh, relevant locative applied object. This last case is where we have no increase in the number of arguments, but some additional semantic information added. So we have, recall, um, as verb gutera, which has three arguments. Um, and we have this reading that Habimana threw the rock at Caritesi. We have, let's see, the denotation there, which I won't go through. But this, in this case, we have 
a denotation that's talking about an argument that already exists in the meaning of the verb and no increase in the number of, of arguments. Nothing syntactically happening. And so, again, uh, when we combine all of these pieces, we get a denotation where the argument that's already present in the meaning of the verb gets an additional lexical entailment on top of it. Namely, in this case, the combination is that the goal of the non-applied verb is a recipient in this case. And I uh, capture this by combining the goal and the beneficiary. I have a bit of a story for how that works, but um, essentially the sets of entailments of being a goal and the sets of entailments of being a beneficiary are both mapped to the same participant, and that participant then is interpreted as, as a recipient participant. And that's what we get in 40A, Habimana through the rock to Karechezi in this case. So then there's all these different kind of lexically determined subclasses of verbs and how they work with their applicative. But the question then becomes, what is an applicative, broadly speaking? What is this form in a language? So I propose that an applicative is a marker of a paradigmatic output condition. And what this says is that non-applied variants of the verb, so verbs that don't have an applicative, and the applied variant of the verb, a verb with the applicative, are related to one another, right? So you, can, you get the meaning of the one that's marked from the meaning that's not marked, right? And they're in a relationship with one another. Um, to jump ahead a little bit, this parallels work on argument alternations, where an oblique phrase may be related to the direct object realization of a particular verb. Um, and it's kind of via that paradigm that you know where the entailments are supposed to be. Um, in those cases, the direct double object construction, say in English, will have a stricter set of entailments than the oblique frame. And so 41 would be this condition that all applicatives should have, which essentially says when you have this pairing between a non-applied and an applied verb, the applied variant will have at least one internal argument, and the truth conditions associated with that internal argument are a strict superset of those associated with its corresponding internal argument in the non-applied variant. Namely, with the applicative, you should have more information about some internal argument. Either you say something more about an argument that's already there, or if you can't do that, you add a new argument and say something about that. Well, that's going much quicker than I expected. Uh, <laughs> um, so the conclusion from the applicative study um, is that verb meaning matters. Um, this is important to determining how these valency changing morphemes work, um, which I think is very important given that often these things are thought of as very productive operators that just spit out a new argument, new thematic role, end of story. Um, this does it's actually, if you look more broadly, isn't very surprising. We've seen from lexical semantic studies that verb meaning is very important to argument structure and does have all of these idiosyncrasies wrapped up with it. Um, it just hadn't been brought into the realm of valency changing morphology. Um, and so the next kind of step would be to look at other valency changing morphemes and see whether they have same, uh, the same or similar types of verb restrictions. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of an existential proof. I don't have much of a, an analysis to give you. Um, but there's this morpheme eek in many Bantu languages, often called a stative or a neuter or a medio passive or a pseudo passive. Um, but essentially, it takes um, a verb and gets rid of the subject argument and promotes the internal argument um, in a way that somewhat resembles a passive, but not quite. So we have in 42 um, the verb kumena to break, the child broke the cup, two arguments, and then the eek marked one here as ik is an intransitive, the cup might break. Um, the cool thing about eek, and what involves a lot more thinking uh, on my part, is that there are a variety of readings that you can get with this, given eek plus some other morphological and semantic facts. So you have this potential reading in 44, this cup might break. Um, you can also get um, a state of reading, like a, just someone can point to a cup and say this cup is broken, and you would use uh, the break verb with this suffix. Um, and you can also get an encoded, this cup broke in the past, change of state uh, interpretation. And to kind of finish off this idea that verb meaning matters, you don't get it with every verb. You find quite a bit, actually, of lexical idiosyncrasy with verbs uh, from different classes. So here we have in 45a, the bread is edible, perfectly fine. But you cannot get the reading that the bread, say, got eaten. So you, the encoded reading is impossible. You can't use it as the state of reading, the bread is all eaten, even though semantically those are all things that can be said, should be said, aren't in their own right 
you know, problematic. There's something about this morpheme with this verb that's limiting the possibilities for what the readings are. Um, so actually what this could suggest as well is that sometimes the combination of valency changing morphology with verbs is just completely idiosyncratic. So we have a case where there's maybe productive application of these rules, which is the traditional way these have been thought of. There's all these verb class specific uh, interactions that I was talking about here. So certain verb classes interact in specific ways with their kind of chosen applicative and every verb within that class will do that, but it's not entirely productive outside of that class. And then you may find that some of these morphemes are just completely unproductive. Um, you find that actually, again, to come back to applicatives, you do find it with a handful of verbs in Kinyar Wanda. They happen to all be unergative verbs, which I find very interesting. Um, but the benefactive doesn't have a productive reading. So in 46a, you have guseka to laugh. And when you use the applicative, it doesn't have the interpretation that, um, who is it, karetesi is laughing on behalf of the child or for the child's benefit or for the child's pleasure, but that karetesi is fond of the child. Um, there's a couple other examples like this where there's some maybe distant semantic relationship, but it's not entirely productive um, from the base meaning of the verb. Um, so to conclude, I've addressed uh, in this talk the question of the role of verb meaning in valency changing morphology um, using the Bantu language Kinyarwanda as a case study for this. Um, I've argued that the applicative can increase the valence of a verb or add semantic information about an existing argument or both, and that this captures a broad typology of possible types of applicative. Um, and then I briefly, very briefly, pointed to some data from the detransitivizing, morph detransitivizing morpheme eek in Kinyarwanda, uh, making a similar point that verb meaning may be at play with this morpheme, um, and that leads to kind of considerable questions for future research. So thank you very much. to collapse the first two by saying something like the, it increases as an argument and the detail of the argument comes from a verb and if there's nothing in the verb then it's just unspecified. Potentially. The one reason I might not want to do that is, so the, um, I mentioned it briefly, that class of ditransitives where the recipient is the role. Mm -hmm. um, in those cases, I think for all of those verbs, I'd have to double check, but for at least some of them, the applied object is optionally a recipient or a kind of classic benefactive. And so I think in that case, you'd want both kind of operations independently operating from one another. Although I don't, I don't see your way of doing it to be un impossible, I guess. Um, but you might want to preserve that difference. I'm going to have to think about that. Yeah. Yeah, I had a, a follow up to that maybe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was thinking that it, it, it sounded a bit like you had an implicit argument there, right? Because you said that, that if I remember that, sort of the conceit is coming from the verb, so it's, it's somehow represented. For these ditransitive yes, cases. Right. Yes, absolutely. That actually is yeah. the point. That, that yeah. It is this class of verbs that does it because those entail a recipient. So when you send like something, there is maybe, oh, I guess that's, that's a, actually an empirical question of whether there's an entailment that there's a recipient. Um, yeah, so in this respect, they But it, it, it like seems like sensible that that would be the like class of verbs. verbs. Like eat, which even if you use them without an object, you would right. still think that there's something implicit in eating. Right, where then in with the verb like eat, you wouldn't expect that there'd be a recipient because yeah, exactly. you don't yeah, 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 yeah. And have something yeah. receiving yeah. that, yeah. yeah. Um, so no, I think I agree. It's exactly because that verb strongly suggests that there's a recipient mm -hmm. that you get yeah. there. And I had another. Thing, if I may. Uh, so when you mentioned 41, I think that was your constraint. The, uh -huh. yeah. And I was thinking at the same time that mm -hmm. it really looks like um, alternations. What people have said about alternations, say in English, with the mm -hmm. double objects and um, and the prepositional data construction. So I mean, you could you could yeah. uh, look at the both the semantics and the syntax of those in more detail because some people suggest that you know you have a, a null head there in mm -hmm. the double object construction, whereas you have this over propositional over, mm -hmm. and the null head might just be the thing that is spelled out in your third mm -hmm. type line. The interesting difference, so yes, I'm essentially treating them as an alternation. Um, the interesting thing is here, in some cases at least, but not in all, it's an alternation with nothing, which is a bit 
like in the, the non-applied variant, you don't have anything yeah, to alternate yeah, yeah, with. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's always additive in some way, which is somehow different, but basically, I think, the same mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. No, I agree. It's, it's basically alternation, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if you have one of these motion verbs and you want to say the one that's not the <coughs> inherent one, like if you want to say crossing to somewhere, yeah. how, is, how do they mm -hmm. do that? They use what I tentatively would call a serial verb construction. So you have the verb to go. And so if like, I wanted to cross to somewhere, you would say I cross, I go, and then the place. Um, but I don't know. I don't know much about those, because but I think there's a lot of cool stuff to be said because I don't know whether you just always use those or if you need like how many different like ways of saying it. I also don't know how you would add in a route because like to and from you have verbs for that, but you don't have the exist like a verb for being a route. I don't think <laughs> um, so. There's a lot more to be said, but roughly that's how it's done is with a, a serial verb ish construction. Yeah. To what extent can you say that this applies to back to languages in general? Um, a little bit. So Lutz has some work showing that Swahili, for example, has cases where you uh, don't get an increase in the number of arguments when you have an applicative, but instead some pragmatic kind of information added to that um, object. Um, so that's a slight difference in that it's a pragmatic kind of effect, um, but I think that quite naturally fits in with the story that's being told here. It's a bit, a bit more needs to be said, definitely. But, um, uh, and then the motion predicates, I, I briefly cited that literature. Um, there are quite a few examples of languages, and again, there are usually just a few mentions in a grammar or a paper um, where you get some kind of effect where a verb will have a goal, for example, with the locative phrase, but it'll only be a handful of motion verbs, for example. So I, I think it's robust, but someone needs to do it, someone do a bigger <laughs> study. Of so, it, yeah. so no one's taken this sort of like three category approach to the applicatives the way that you have with Kinderwanda and applied it to another language, or is there data for that within another language? Uh, there's not yet. Um, if someone gives me the grant I'm hoping they give me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, that, that's, I think that really, because there's a nice in-depth but also typological kind of story that can be told here. Um, so one of the big questions I have mm -hmm. is, um, that really keeps me up at night, is the degree to which this motion typology is replicated across languages, or if it's arbitrary. If it just happens to be that manner of motion verbs in Kinyarwanda feel like being this way, but then in Bukusu, it's actually that they're all sources. Or if in Bukusu, it just happens to be that they're all general locations. Or if there's regional reasons, or if there's even at some degree a human cognitive preference for these classes to link to these different roles. Um, and at, at this point, that's a completely open question. Can I ask just one more sure. on this thread? Um, and have you seen anything similar in that, like, Applicativization in other languages, like a similar sort of structure? I um, haven't really. I have a colleague of mine at the University of Texas who's looking at Tepewan, um, which is spoken in Mexico. I forget what language family it's part of, which is um, because I'm standing in front of a room full of people. <laughs> um, but he, he has been doing some work there on that language and, and thinks there's some, some comparable things going on with the benefactors there. Other than that, I can't say that I know of anything, but Nobody's also, I think, taking quite this look at applicatives in other languages either. And so I think it could be there, but not have been noticed or talked about in kind of a systematic way. Like, like are you suggesting then that the, like, our understanding of the applicative should be sort of redefined based on this particular finding? I mean, that sounds a bit bold of me to suggest that, but I think, I think that the empirical evidence is that applicatives are much more variable than they've been talked about, at least in um, kind of the classic syntactic literature um, on, like, say, object symmetry, which is very much you add a new applied object, and then it has some thematic role, and then here is a bunch of syntactic properties of that. Um, and this is just showing that actually the starting point is much further back. It's what is the applicative doing in this particular context, and how does that interact with the meaning of the verb? Um, so I have a, a paper on Bukusu that shows that um, the object symmetry fact, so this is where the, um, so, so when you add an applicative to a transitive verb, you end up with the derived ditransitive. So you have three arguments, and then a big question has been the degree to which those two objects are the same or different. So is the applied object a true object, or is it more of an object? And um, what I found in Bakusu is that with a specific subclass of verbs, you get a different pattern from other verbs in the language. You're talking about the hierarchy of the objects, then? Um, essentially, yeah. And so there's been a lot of work looking at that in, in these languages. Actually, it's probably what most of the work on applicatives have, has been in Bantu. Um, 
but actually it seems again that semantics is coming into play to some degree, and that the, the, it was ingestive verbs in Bukusu um, have a different pattern when, actually it's for the causative, but it's kind of the same it's idea. Ingestive. Ingestive, so eat and drink. Um, some, in some languages, like, like learn, any kind of intake, I guess. Um, so yeah, I think ultimately I would say that there's more here than people have been giving credit for, and that semantics is really a driving factor that hasn't been fully considered. Um, yeah, I was actually wondering about one of the verb types that you mentioned in the beginning because you said that I think you uh, characterized cross as a verb of departure. Yeah. Um, could it also be a path verb, or what was the? I, so okay, yeah. So the the manner of motion verbs at the very beginning are very kind of robustly found class across other languages. The other two classes I really only kind of found here. Mm -hmm. um, so those classes are really just pattern name, like they're they're only defined by being in this way. Um, and I've wondered kind of a lot about why cross works the way it does. Um, because again, any motion verb is going to have a source route and goal. So there's no, it's not that verbs of departure care more about the source than verbs of jumping because in both cases there's a, there's all three pieces. Yeah. Um, so. But I mean, cross in particular seems to, I mean, you seem to sort of, it, it says something about what you're crossing, right? Which is the path. Or right, sort of yeah. Path. I mean, how you move along the path. So yeah. in the ocean that you're crossing before you select, right? So, oh, is, is your question like, why is it considered a verb of departure if the primary argument that's taking is the thing that it's crossing? Uh, or is it actually it? independent of that, but that's, that, that might yeah. be the point. I mean, I guess so it would differ from other, path, like what I was calling path verbs, like enter, where I guess the <coughs> thing is the, the goal. Yeah. And the, the, yes. the thing, the verbal object is the goal. So are you classifying them by what additional argument is out of them? Yes, yeah, I'm just kind of, uh, yeah, there's no independent motivation for it. Because the motion's already big. Yeah, so there is some work too, yeah, that, um, especially I think with cross. So in English, there's been some work because um, there's this ambiguity with in and into. So sometimes mm -hmm. in has a reading of into. And I think punctual movements prefer the into reading or at least easier to get it. So if I, if I say I walked in a room, you would probably think it was just a generic location unless there was a context in which I primed you to kind of know that there was a very quick punctual change. So that's, that's something that very much could be at play here too, actually, is the nature of the, uh, the, 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 the event. Um, so yeah, can you go back to the example with cross? Yeah. Um, since this is the discussion, um, I think it has buts in it. It does, yeah. So this is also in other Oops. languages been, yeah, so, oh, let me go on. Yeah. Oops, so, do you have that as context? Because I think some people would have that as a separative uh, suffix. So you could have, so fitting in with this discussion that Andras started as well, you could have the verb originally being something like am, or indeed amba, Uts being a separative extension which has mm. now become grammaticalized to be cross from, depart, leave. So mm. cross, but cross essentially meaning having left in my own crossing something. And mm. that's now, presumably you no longer have the form um. So this yeah. is now grammaticalized to inherently include this point of departure separation from something. Potentially, that's a good thing to check for. I don't, I don't know if it would, I guess there's also a hook in Guhaga Uka. Yeah, so I mean the Which, chronology or the not actually all of them. <laughs> okay. it's, it's um, not yeah. clear for the, the you know, everyone's eyes, but I mean, this seems to me to be, given the semantics and given what And given that it's all that, three, all of these verbs in this class that I've given you have book have in them, there could be a historical reason So I would have that as yeah. morphologically complex. And, and how would that be classed? Um, set, <laughs> separate two. And what or, does that mean? So to separate, so sometimes verbs like jump, so you're separating yourself from the ground, mm, jump, so um, and different, or um, co contacted, D, what's the opposite of contacted? Discontent, something like that. Um, so yeah. So the verb, when you said jump, actually, the verb jump also has the ook. I mean, again, I don't know the degree, but I don't know for sure any of this historically. Um, but this would definitely be in a different class. I guess kuiruga also has ook. So it would. This is, this is sorry. I switched to a different slide when you were talking. So all of the. Um, departure verbs have book, but actually, it's, now that I'm thinking about it, so do two of the manner of motion verbs. Um, which is to say that, it, which isn't to say that there's not something there, but I wonder what it is. Yeah. So, That's a good so point, my original actually. question was mm. going to be, uh, 
thinking beyond the, the data you presented here, mm. if you have an idea of how this all comes about. Right? So, I'm, of course, I'm always that is, in language change. So, yeah. if you have a story for why some versions end up happening, I don't. So, um, um, what's her first name? Pakirati. Though she was here at Sara. Sara, yeah. Sara wrote her thesis on a historical mm -hmm. story of Eve, which I uh, have just been asked to read. Uh, for a book review, so I haven't actually read it like cover to cover yet. So I think she has some ideas. Um, I don't actually. <laughs> I guess is my answer. Um, I think partly because I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure there's enough kind of detailed semantic work in this particular area, looking from this perspective, on enough languages to know what the facts even are. Uh, or any, so any, any thoughts I have are extremely kind of just like. Like something I was like, I don't know, thought of in the shower. It's not like something like where I could really give an answer, I think. So I suppose I was thinking the other way around. So uh -huh. the things that you presented perhaps as idiosyncrasies mm. could uh, not be, yeah. yeah um, at, some, at some point in the past. Um, but yeah, it's an open, I mean, that's a massive. Yeah. Question. I mean, I guess so, so like when I brought up the um, completely lexicalized cases, like the, the being fond of the mm -hmm. child thing, um, it is interesting that I have like three or four examples of those, and they're all unergative verbs. So, I mean, maybe there's something with. I don't, I, again, like, don't know what that would be, but there could be something with unergative verbs where that event just doesn't want to be productive, and so you get lexicalized, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a great question, I, I, but I don't really have anything interesting to say about it, unfortunately. <laughs> um, How did you collect and like, go through the data for that? Um, so it started, like, originally, years and years and years ago, I was a research assistant on a project doing machine translation, and I was annotating um, genocide testimonials, actually. Um, and was noticing a lot of cases where you weren't getting objects where I thought you were suppo supposed to, um, and kind of a variety of other grammatical things that just weren't coming up, and then eventually that project sent me to Rwanda to collect some data, and then um, I kind of just pulled the threads of things that I noticed in the speech text um, to get more kind of from there. So mostly interviews from this data, but the, the, the kind of noticing of something going on happened by looking at actual speech. And do you know if this happens cross dialectically in Kinyarwanda? No, because I don't know anything about dialects in Kinyarwanda because there is um, a lot of them, and people that are from even the same region will say things differently. So, like, there are three different ways to pronounce the word for money, and I don't know why there's three. Like, there's not like a like the people <coughs> I know who say these words differently aren't from very different places. So it's not. I, I again. I have thoughts, but nothing systematic, and I don't do variationist work, so I think somebody should go in and um, do a more detailed, um, and, and that's also a country that's had a lot of internal movement because of its history. So I think you get a really interesting sociolinguistic story of people moving to different places for varieties of reasons, or repatriating from different countries after many, many years in Uganda or Congo or something. So um, I don't know, um, but I think there's a lot of interesting and important facts kind of tied up with that. Um, I was interested in you know, how it ties in with your talk. There have been, you have seen some papers where people characterize the use of the applicative mm -hmm. extension. And the uh, one that I can come out of my head of the obviously the benefactive one and the locative one mm -hmm. that you've been speaking about. But also, you've got two others the um, instrumental one, mm -hmm. where you add an argument which is a tool or something you're going to use. And also, sometimes you get intensive ones. Yeah. So um, the intensive, I haven't been able to find in Kinyarwanda. Um, I had a chat with a friend who spoke Luganda, and it seems like she had that in, in Luganda. But in Kinyarwanda, I haven't come across that. In Kinyarwanda, um, the instrumental is a completely different morpheme. And it's syncretistic with the causative. Um, a few, that's kind of a regional feature of the Great Lakes area, so it's ish uh, in Kinyarwanda. Um, and I have a whole other paper on that, <laughs> actually. So it's, and actually, um, could have included it here, because there's, uh, so there's these two different possible readings of instrument or causative, and the meaning of the verb actually can, in some ways, determine whether you get an instrument or a causative reading. Um, so it's kind of the same story, actually, with the other applicative form in the language. I mean, it would be nice to think that, but I just looked up my own data on Chindamba here, uh -huh. and my example is one where the, uh, the verb to uh, cultivate, mm -hmm. and the meaning depends what 
semantics of the added object are. So if you add a person, you're doing it for them, and if you add a, a how, you're doing it with it. Ah, yes, so that's worth saying as well, that um, I've been a bit dishonest with you, um, <laughs> but so has everybody else, I think, in, <laughs> in this literature. So I kept talking about benefactive duplicatives and locative duplicatives as if they're separate forms, and actually they're not. It's one morpheme that is the same. Um, which I think you're exactly right, though, that the interpretation is going to follow because locative duplicatives are always going to be marked with a location on the applied object. One is, is, is clear, I think. Yeah, and then in Kinyarwanda, at least, I, I can't speak to the other, other languages uh, now, but in Kinyarwanda, at least, it'd be disambiguated by whether there's a locative prefix on the applied object or not. And then um, with the instrumental uh, slash causative duplicative, there's, I think, some degree of the applied object, but also the meaning of the verb comes into play to varying degrees. Um, yeah, yes, so, so actually you're right that the applied object itself can determine their interpretation um, as well. Yeah. But you might expect that to happen less with your, with your second class, right? Where the, if, with, so with those, with those particular applied objects, which sort of just fill in something that the verb already has, mm -hmm. has um, you kind of you, you would expect less less semantic variation. If I understood. In, so you're talking about the motion verbs here. Um, no, I'm talking about those where the applicative doesn't seem to. So those those that look like the the English alternations, for example. Ah. Uh, um, yeah, so I'm actually currently working on that class more specifically, um, and it kind of becomes, I, I, I basically can't wrap my head around it because you get these kinds of interactions, but then also sometimes a locative applicative. So it's like, it's really difficult, which then kind of overlaps with transfer of motion verbs anyway, which is what often yeah. these diagrams are about. So you can get like lots of overlapping patterns, I guess, to kind of mm -hmm. summarize it uh, a bit. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is some interaction. It seems like you can get both types of applicative meaning, but they have slightly different meanings depending, and it's still not clear what all of those are for all of the different classes. So uh, which class was that you were just discussing? This is those ditransitives. Okay. Um, and so, for example, that... Oh, instead of throwing it out, you throw it to it, isn't it? Yeah, but then if you... You can also seem to get like a locative interpretation if it's not a person of like, I threw it there, um, that sometimes has a third... Specific. So it... it, it I mean, that again is pretty much like, like in, in alternation with send, right? So yeah. in English you... It's actually that verb that's yeah. driving me yeah, yeah. a bit insane. So you can't send... I mean, many people say you can't send, send the library the book, but you can send the people the book. So there's a difference right. in being animate or not. Right. Which, so in one sense right. of location, you have the recipient. So that, that's, that's maybe... Yeah, nice. the, tricky, the tricky part is that you can, in some cases that we're finding, you can get like a locative marked person yeah. In places where I don't mm -hmm. expect them, basically. But um, the, all this, I, 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 actually, at some point, I can show you kind of where we're at with, with the diatribe paper. Mm -hmm. Get your thoughts. So I'm kind of banging my head against mm -hmm. the table at, at the moment. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think, again, your story is like there's a population of semantic issues. So, so in Denver, for example, if you can get, you know, jump, jump over something at a place, but you can also jump over people. And you can't, you can't, you can't jump for someone. You can only jump over them. Mm -hmm. So even even if it's a human, it will be the location of source. Mm -hmm. But you can run for someone. Mm -hmm. And you know, it seems again. I think you know, you know, have to look at the detail. But if you look at you know, look at these sort of locative type of cases, some of them allow an attractive interpretation mm -hmm. with the right object, but others are really resistant to that. And it's just even though the context is very, could be very good factor, you still end up with variation. <coughs> and it looks like, again, it's, it's, it's lexical, lexical semantics. Right. Hmm. So even, even sort of a, even a very strong context couldn't sort of force jumping for someone else. I don't think so. I think then you have to go exactly yeah. like what, what Kai said to an alternative construction yeah. on behalf of, for the benefit yeah. of uh -huh. mm -hmm. the proposition. That would then work, but you don't have to object that. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Mm -hmm. The other, well, I guess this is, it's kind of the opposite side of this, but um, so these locative marked things kind of look like prepositions in Kinyarwanda, um, and I, I have evidence that they're not, 
But in some case, or I guess part of the evidence for that is that, so with, which firm was it? Kuvuga to talk? There. Um, with this verb, I'll give you the applicative example, you have to have this applicative to give the locative phrase at all, so you can't talk in the house without the applicative there. Mm -hmm. um, but this seems completely lexically actually very idiosyncratic. So some verbs you can just slap a locative phrase on there, no applicative, and like everything's cool. But some verbs obligatorily have it. And that's where this um, ditransitive studies got confusing, is that some verbs require this to have a locative, and some verbs have a locative without the applicative. And it seems a bit arbitrary why that is, which from like a human <coughs> learning language perspective is kind of blows my mind. Like I don't know how people would keep track of all of this lexical idiosyncrasy. Um, but it seems that they must. I mean, it, um, and so yeah, this verb, you have to have an applicative to get a locative phrase at all. Um, if, like, in Rwanda is used with so much, I mean, I assume there's quite a bit of variation? In, in the the speaker like, variation? Yeah. I mean, I've observed it. I don't have any, like, kind of... Like, so does that present problems in, like, actually being able to determine these patterns for language in general, if some people might just be completely selecting these features differently? Yes, so that's why I made that little snarky comment where I said that this is very robust with speakers. Because <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of variation, but the patterns I've been hammering at, I've gotten really, almost surprisingly clear judgment. Especially with, like, that Gutera case, the throwing to or at. Um, to me, when I was, like, doing all of this, I was surprised that this was the contrast and kind of didn't believe that there was no change in balance, right? Um, but speaker after speaker after speaker uh, is very like, no, 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 this is you threw it at him, he's not paying attention, you're just being a jerk, and this one you threw it to him like he wants to catch it. And people are that clear, I mean, uh, they're, they really have strong intuitions about that, and that's been across I, every person I've asked about these verbs, which is like everybody I know. So did you go in with your set of verbs already made them? What's that? Um, no, so it's kind of, I don't remember how I started looking at it. I think, so the motion ones, um, yeah, I, you know. Okay. Did I, you go back and check with your previous interviewers to see? Um, mostly, actually, I, I should put, I don't think I ever made it this far. So, um, <laughs> I, there have been several people I've worked with over the years on Kinyarwanda, but these people have all been with, like, the people I go back to for this, this project especially. Um, so, while I have other kind of people consulting on things, um, I've run all of these and it's by at least this set of people. And many of them, there's a lot of variety in age and in um, say expat status and, and things like that. Again, this is for people, so it's not like a, like a systematic sociolinguistic creationist study or anything like that. But as to the degree possible, I've tried to ask the same people the same questions the same ways. Um, to the degree, again, kind of possible. This is a really innocent and very ignorant question, but is that enough people? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think, I think that, um, like I was saying before, actually, no, I wasn't saying this before. I said this like two days ago to somebody else. Uh, so technically, <laughs> technically before, but not like <laughs> the way you would know about. Um, I think that this pairs really nicely with um, corpus type studies. And um, I'd really like to do experimental studies on this. So I was briefly mentioning earlier how I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows why, like, why you would have these preferences for different parts of the path, for example. And that could be uh, genetic, it could be inherited from the earlier stages of the language, there could be kind of linguistic reasons for that, or there could actually be cognitive reasons for that. And the way to test that would be to put together some kind of novel um, novel verb study. So in, um, these are used a lot in psycholinguistics where people make up verbs that sound like they could be part of the language but aren't. And so in this case, they would describe different types of motion going different directions, and then I would slap an applicative on there and be like, where's that going? And, is the source of the route, um, and that would help weed out, rule out that as a possible explanation. Is there something bigger as to why, or is this an idiosyncratic thing? Um, so all that's to say, I think for the patterns here, it's enough in that it's robust across each of these people, um, and in minimally, this can describe their grammars. Um, but ideally, I think there's a bigger question of what these things are, outside of Kenya Wanda even. Maybe one just tiny mm -hmm. question. Um, yeah, so the point about, from a child language acquisition perspective, um, I think you could also think of that the other way around. I can't quite get my head around it, but it's probably more important to know if I threw a stone at someone mm. or to someone than if I spoke in a house 
versus whatever the alternation without the applicative is there. I can, right? So like you're talking about the obligatoriness of the locative applicative in some cases? Yeah, so what I would think be the ambiguity that results from I spoke mm. without the applicative is probably less and those are the only two examples that I can like. Yeah, I'm trying to think of with. more examples. Yeah. Um, so speak versus like throw at or throw to or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's also worth saying, though, that that kind of example was chosen simply because it really illustrates the semantic difference. But that ditransitive structure could also be like, I threw the stone at the wall. right? It doesn't have to be a human in that case. So it is just that it's a goal. Even in cases where it's a person, though, mm -hmm. it's still a goal. Um, but I throw the stone, stone to the wall, so it doesn't quite work. That, I, need, I had asked about that, and some were buried in a bunch of notes that I can't remember what the pattern was. We had gone through all these different ditransits and looked at whether you could give things to the wall yeah. uh, in an absence of things. Um, so, yes, I, there's more to be said. Um, yeah. Um, when I hear people talk about applicatives, I sometimes um, think about this German prefix, which I would like to think of as an applicative. Mm -hmm. So then just with throw, I can now thought of it as well. So you can, whether you have an intransitive or transitive, um, you can add this prefix be not not to all verbs but to many of them. And so with throw, for example, the only accusative object that you can have, I think, would be the wall, I guess. Yeah. Um, and and so you so I was just thinking that, you know, maybe maybe in a sort of very exotic language from this perspective, um would be, yeah, yeah. Would be interesting to, to look at as well because those those patterns are so is that if you throw so you can say you can say you can say I throw, and usually throw takes uh, an accusative object, which is which is the thing that you throw. Mm -hmm. But you can add this prefix be, and then you say I I the throw, and then the accusative object of that will be um, the, the goal, the goal, so really? the wall, for example. Yeah. When happens to the object? What happens to the object? Uh, it has to be an oblique, oblique with uh, with uh -huh. yeah, interesting kind of instrument. The underlying kind of verbal object becomes the oblique yeah. instrument. Oh, okay. That's yeah. really interesting. So those patterns are, are fun, and since yeah. they they are very idiosyncratic as well, I think. Mm. and you have, you can have them with with so throw would be one of them. You have them with certain levels of motion as well. Mm. Um, you can so you can you can go. You can also go, which means that you sort of then walk around an area, and the area becomes the the accused object. So it's kind of the, hmm. the go in a way. Do you know if that happens in the later languages in general? I think Dutch has 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 a bit of this, but in slightly different ways. Um, but I've never sort of, I, I think it's something that people haven't really looked at. Yeah, a woman in my department when I was in Texas wrote a, like a term paper on the German applicative, but I don't know how far she got her. She stuck with it after that. She was German, so I think she was just opportunistically kind of writing <laughs> yeah. on something. So it's, I don't think easy to find a consultant. Stuff, <laughs> and it's, I mean, the, it might just be an interesting sort of source of. Yeah, no, it, it, I should definitely take a look at it. Yeah. 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 And again, we kind of, help to some degree with this kind of broader, like what are oh, the yeah. patterns yeah. outside? Yeah. I mean, is it yeah. just that there's tons of lexical yeah. idiosyncrasy and kids just have to learn this, or are there some kind of predictable kind of things you get outside of this, or? Yeah. yeah. I think you may have mentioned this before, but um, what exactly are you planning on doing with this? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm applying right now for grants to, to do this study on motion, lock of, with motion verbs with lock of, specifically, and so my goal there is to replicate this kind of semantic -y study in maybe two or three other languages, which would involve a lot of uh, sitting down with consultants and, and going through judgments, um, having some kind of cross-linguistic uh, database of sorts, so looking through grammars and papers on a variety of Bantu languages from ideally throughout the continent, um, and then having, again, this novel word study in a handful of languages as well. Um, so kind of pieces from each angle of it, looking in depth at a small number of languages and then looking broadly at a lot of languages and then looking um, at these kind of what, you, what speakers invent when you give them new verbs that describe different kinds of motion. Still all fun to them. At this, yeah, at this point, yeah. Um, 
given my persistent desire to just keep going back to that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good though. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think, I think um, the micro variation in this case is really nice because the, the structures will look very, very similar that will be related to each other. Um, and so if, say, Kinyarwanda and some other nearby Bantu language have completely different patterns, that's, that's actually really interesting. Whereas if, or it, it's not that Kinyarwanda being different from Walpuri or something wouldn't be interesting, but it's, it's this, you can find so much variation just within Bantu mm -hmm. that I think it's a nice starting point in that it's really, I mean, kind of comparing apples to apples and, and getting a sense of what the variation is within the, the subfamily. Is it enough to redefine like what the applicative does just based on one language family? Um, so I mean, it's entirely possible. The nice thing, I guess, about this, or one way you can think about this, is I'm not necessarily saying every single language would have to have all of these different applicative types. You could probably and would probably find that you'll have some degree of this in each language, and how this would work in each language would differ. I think verb meaning is has to be relevant to every language. I mean, I. I I really think if people looked at the lexical semantics of applicatives in any language, they would find some kind of stuff there. Um, but minimally, all languages, I mean, the classic definition of applicative is that you add an object, add a thematic role. So all of them will share that. Whether they have these other kinds of things, I imagine they would, but it wouldn't be necessarily a problem. This position challenges that, that sort of basic premise of it, right? Because it's, it's sort of talking like less about adding, adding arguments and more about uh, like it's actually, I mean, yeah, you're right that in that my kind of conception of applicative is, is a semantic uh, definition. It's adding lexical entailment. So I guess from that view, I would be um, redefining it. But it's entirely possible, I guess, too, that there's a syntactic applicative out there in the world's languages where a language just uses it as a transit advisor, adding a new object. And then in other languages, you have this semantic effect of marking um, paradigms. And I think, like Hannah said, there could be a historical reason for that, right? Like it's kind of conceivable that a language would have a productive operation that then would start to get lexicalized, or vice versa, a lexicalized kind of set of patterns that then just gets too unruly until so language starts to rope it in to have it be more productive. So I think these, um, all, all of these things can exist. The world's big enough for all of it, I think. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily offend me. <laughs> it, all, it all can fit within the same story. Because actually, technically, Adding a new argument and a new participant is increasing the lexical entailments of the clause. You're adding more semantic information. You're naming a new participant that's not there in the non-applied variant. So even in that case, this kind of classic syntactic case, that's still actually captured by the semantic approach. So technically, any applicativization is adding new information. Right, because if you throw it to the person, you're throwing it at them for them. Yes. So you're right. adding a for them right. argument, which happens. But even in, the more, even in this um, <clears throat> speaking case, so actually, this is, this is I think, Crucial. So even in this case, where we have speaking in the house, you have the applicative adding a new object position, assigning a thematic role to it. This is still increasing the set of entailments of the clause compared to just Kyle or Lasse spoke or talked. Um, and so actually in that case, even though people have talked about this very syntactically, that is also satisfying the semantic constraint by increasing the entailments associated with the clause in a specific way. So does that mean that if you have the applicative here and then you have the house, which is like the argument added to the applicative, that house is not an adjunct? No, it's not an adjunct. It's definitely an object, yeah. Whereas if you had it without the applicative, it would be an adjunct. Oh, with this verb, you couldn't have it uh, without the applicative. Uh -huh. And I would even argue that in cases where you have verbs where you can get the locative phrase, it's still an argument. Okay. Um, yeah, because it can show agreement. It can be the subject of a passive. Um, that might vary among languages, but definitely in Kinyarwanda. Are there any cases in Kinyarwanda where you take something that's an adjunct and turn it into um, an argument? I have yet to it? find it. So that's kind of another classic thing about applicatives is they're thought of often as this promotion operation where you have an oblique and then it's promoted. I haven't found any instance where you get a clear cut adjunct relationship with okay. these. Um, so I think they're and worth looking at in their own right. Because your, your instrumentals are causatives. Yeah, so it could just be an instance. I mean, other languages may have that kind of set of facts. It's not, but in Kinyarwanda specifically, it seems like you, you don't get that. The, the applicative just does what it does. Mm -hmm. um, so for any kind of thing like in, in the house or last week or something like that? Mm. Or yeah, so that's something I need to think through a bit more, is how other kinds of information would come into play. Because it definitely seems like this needs to be a locket of some kind, this new information. So it's like, they all add new information, but actually a very 
restricted kind. Mm -hmm. um, or like, some, like technically, if I negated this sentence, that would be adding an entailment to the clause. Like, mm -hmm. There's other ways yeah. you can satisfy this constraint that I don't want to deal yeah. with yeah. Um, <laughs> and wouldn't want to. Um, so it definitely seems to be related to this argument and a particular thematic information about it. Mm -hmm. um, If there are no more questions or comments, then first of all, let us uh, thank Kyle very much for this.